We're gonna we're gonna begin this morning. Welcome everybody, and thank you very much for being here. We're going to uh, begin this morning with a presentation of the colors. And presenting the colors this morning is is the uh, Moody High School NJROTC, led by Cadet Resende. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. this morning and uh, we're blessed to have Chaplain Curtis from the Naval Air Station Corpus Christi lead us in that invocation. Thank you. Let us pray. Oh God our Heavenly Father, under your watchful eyes we gather at this place dedicated to the wonder and the beauty of waves crashing on the shores of a nation we love, on the shores of a nation on the other side of the world, where those waves provided comfort and peace to a nation desperate for comfort and peace. We gather to remember heroism in hopes that our own hearts would be stirred toward selfless sacrifice. We gather to long together for the, for the fulfillment of your promise that one day swords will be beaten into plowshares and we'll study war no more. So, Lord, we invite your presence, just as you have been with the veterans we honor in their time of need. Your word says, greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. We're humbled by the love that has driven our countrymen to place themselves in harm's way for the good of this nation. We see, Lord, the immeasurable power and majesty in the waves of water that crash on our shores. We see waves that are full of life and energy. We see forces that can toss around enormous ships, change shorelines, form and destroy that which seems immovable. Let our honor be so. Let our service be so. Let our hope be so. Let our love be so. And let them lead us with these dedicated veterans we honor through whatever battles we must face to lasting justice, liberty, and peace. For we ask it in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Wow. <laughs> Great job, Lieutenant Commander. Thank you very much. I, I would ask also that as long as the uh, Lieutenant Commander's in the building, would y'all please watch your language? <laughs> He's been around sailors and marines all his life, and he's never really heard any bad things. <laughs> we do not want to uh, baptize him in profanity here. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed. First of all, I'm amazed at how many collared shirts. There's never been this many collared shirts in the Texas Surf Museum ever. So that's a record. And uh, really, really blessed to have you all here. I'm going to recognize a few people and keep it short, I promise. But none of this would have been possible at all. None, none of this and none of this would have been possible at all without some uh, sponsorships, very generous sponsorships from community organizations and leaders. And I, I'll miss some. And where's it? Yeah, y'all sit down. <laughs> Emily is really in charge here, so do what she said. That's what I'm going to do. Uh, Port of Corpus Christi, Rosie Colleen is here with Port of Corpus Christi. has been an ongoing great 
supporter Larry Haas and Martha Respondek are here. There's Martha up front. Unbelievable sponsors for all of the Surf Museum activities. Heart Research Institute, David Yaskowitz right here. Uh, Texas A&M Corpus Christi, American Bank, um, Allison is, well, <laughs> Margaret looks like an American Bank employee, but um, Allison is here, uh, the Marina Arts District, Andrews Distributing and Pacifico Bear, ongoing, very, very consistent supporters of the Texas Surf Museum. Kick me if there's anybody else. Um, <laughs> Sarah Banta is right there, and Sarah, I'm wearing my USL pin, but the, the evolution of this exhibit, I, it really, in a, briefly, China Beach Viet, surfing during the Vietnam War in California. We went out and visited, got the opportunity to bring that here, trying to figure out how best to showcase such an amazing exhibit that is surfing and service. Uh, we reached out to USO South Texas. Been one of the best moves that we've ever made. If you don't believe that, Sarah will tell tells me often the best move I've ever made <laughs> is reaching out to Sarah Banton and USO South Texas. Um, great partnership, and and we're we're blessed in that um, with Sarah comes Steve Banta, the executive director of the USS Lexington and his unbelievable team of volunteers who printed all the 3,414 dog tags that are here. And this exhibit here is a permanent exhibit, and I, I, I could not tell you exactly how it all came together. It truly was a collaboration with people like Sarah, people like Steve, the veterans like all of y'all that are in this in this room and and it just happened and with some generous donations and, and a lot of hard work we're we're very proud to not only showcase kind of the era where all of this took place during the vietnam war you know no matter how, if it was an unpopular conflict or it was what we were supposed to, we're, we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about the 3,414 Texans who died serving their country. All they did was serve their country. Some of them were plucked off of the beach, and some of those people are here right now and dropped into the jungle. But everybody there gave the ultimate sacrifice for their country and did the right thing. So uh, there are, I know there are a number of veterans here today. Would all the veterans please stand up and let us welcome you and wish you happy Veterans Day? Can we do that? Say happy Veterans Day, but we wish you all a blessed Veterans Day. How about that? Um, is is Mayor McComb? I don't think he's here yet. We'll just roll on and okay. grab. Okay. He comes in, we'll pop him in. Yes. Um, I, I really want to say something funny about Mayor McComb, but I'm going to resist <laughs> because, <laughs> because I don't want my name to be on a wall someday. Um, <laughs> So, so the, the, the uh, collaboration with USO South Texas has, has been meaningful and wonderful also in ways that, that involve friendship and support and advice and ability to, to go to surf camp with uh, Sarah Banta and some of the active duty personnel out at the base. So Sarah, would you please come up and just make a few comments? Sarah Banta, USO South Texas. Thank you all so much for being here. And yes, Brad, it's appropriate. Happy Veterans Day. Okay. Thank you all for your service. Um, those who served in uniform and those who served in other ways. 
Um, as a 26 year Navy wife, I understand what that other service means. So thank you all for being here and what a pleasure and honor it is to be part of this Waves of Honor exhibit. Um, the partnership with the Texas Surf Museum and the USS Lexington and all that entails is just incredible. It's been wonderful to experience. I look forward to a growing relationship with the Texas Surf Museum. Obviously, the relationship with the Lexington's pretty locked in. So, um, <laughs> I think we're all good there. I see, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> but thank you all so much, and I think that as joyous as an occasion as it is to celebrate our veterans, it's also really important to remember the somberness of those who did make the ultimate sacrifice, and that's what this exhibit does. It really showcases and pays tribute to the Texans, the Texans, your neighbors, that paid the ultimate sacrifice. So may we not ever forget what the true cost of war is, and that's what we're here to do today, is to honor that service, and remember that service and honor those who are in your very backyard ready to write that check. You have student pilots training in your backyard who are ready to write that check. Please don't ever forget that. And please remember to thank them when you see them. Thank you, Brad. I appreciate you. And thank you for saving Steve's truck. <laughs> I'll tell you guys that story later. But thank you all for being here. And thank you for this exhibit. So when, when, when I went out to visit China, the China Beach exhibit at the California Surf Museum in Oceanside, you know, amazing exhibit, people going through the, the, whole, the whole exhibit and with tears in their eyes, and a lot of videos and a lot of uh, personal stories. And not that we discriminate here, but they were all Californians. <laughs> and, they, you know, so there was a whole bunch of people, and understandably so, that, that exhibit took place on the West Coast and next to Camp Pendleton. Well, when we brought it here, we wanted to um, Texify it. And we wanted to find, and, and this, this sounds easier than it was, we wanted to find surfers who were surfing before their service in Vietnam, who went to Vietnam, served their country, and then surfed when they got back. And that was more difficult than we thought, but we found three here in Corpus Christi and three from around the state. I, I'm sure there are more. Um, but one of the ones that, that we interviewed um, was a man named Robert Kanicki. And Robert is here today, and he's going to say a few remarks. But listening to his story, it just reminded me that, that Robert was commanding a helicopter in Vietnam at an age where I was running around being a horse's rear someplace. <laughs> and, you know, I did, at, at, when, at Robert's age, I didn't think some, my sons would ever function as human beings, let alone command a gunship and, and serve their country. So, um, Robert, if you would come up here. Robert is the one who looks a lot like Robert Duvall in Apocalypse Now. <laughs> Well, I don't know about that, but he did make us famous, uh, 1st Cavalry Division. He, he certainly helped with his uh, apocalypse now. Um, <laughs> Charlie don't surf this beach. Yeah, I might do the one about the napalm. <laughs> First thing I'd like to do is, is thank Brad. Uh, it's quite an honor to have the opportunity to stand up and talk and tell a bit of my story, uh, but also 
to have the opportunity to honor those that I served with, uh, my brothers and sisters uh, that served in Vietnam. So, uh, Brad, I, I, I really would like to express my appreciation and uh, you really, I, I don't think you can imagine how much you've helped a number of veterans. This is all part of our healing process. And I thank you very much. Uh, when I was asked to speak today, I, I wasn't really, I was just told to say what you'd like. And uh, if it comes from the heart, all the better. And so I thought long and hard about what I wanted to say. And I'm sure you all have all heard war stories and whatnot. And I'm not here to tell you that. But what I am here to tell you today is what it was like to be a teenager back in the 60s. <laughs> and, and to be surfing here and, and having a great time and how in just a matter of one or two years your life can change. Um, I'm going to do that by taking you back uh, to when I first came to Corpus Christi in 1965 and discovered surfing. And, uh, and very briefly I'm going to take you all the way to when I was standing at the top of uh, the stairs of that Boeing 707. Uh, in Cameron Bay, and I saw my first landscape of Vietnam. Um, the other thing I'd like to do today is uh, I was trying to figure out how would be the best way to honor those that have fallen in battle, and uh, not just our Texans here, but the over 58,000 names that are on the wall. And I started looking for poems and, and whatnot uh, online and see if someone had done something that I thought was pretty good. You're going to have to bear with me because I couldn't find anything I liked, so I ended up writing my own. And I'm not a poet, but uh, I'll do my best. So the, the first thing I want to talk about is my first experience is I came over the bridge in Corpus Christi in 1965. Uh, I was 16 years old. We'd been living in Virginia. My dad was a career soldier, and uh, he was uh, reassigned to come to Corpus Christi and be a part of uh, a RADMAC, which was called back then CCAT now. Uh, and he was going to be a command sergeant major out there. To me, it was great. We topped the, uh, the bridge, and I saw the skyline for the first time, and I thought, wow, I'm home. This is great. I uh, discovered surfing that summer of 1965, and uh, I thought I was, I died and gone to hell. It was, it was so much fun. The first time I paddled and caught a wave, it lifted me up, and all of a sudden I was, I was out of the water, standing up, and, and it was just a, a fantastic feeling. So much so that it became probably one of the most important things in my life. More important than school. <laughs> uh, not as important as girls. <laughs> but uh, I served every opportunity I had. And uh, 19, uh, the fall of 1965, I entered uh, my senior year at King High School. I had just turned 17 years old. and. Uh, wasn't even thinking about the draft yet. I mean, I was 17, I had plenty of time. And uh, all through that year, I served, had a great time that summer. I turned 18 in, in uh, August. But that summer, it was, it was one of the best I had. I, we went down to South Padre Surf there. I mean, I was having a great time. The last thing I was even thinking about was going in the military. Uh, back then, uh, of course, there was a draft, and uh, you could be classified a number of different ways. Being classified 1A was the worst. That meant you were, I guess if you didn't want to go in the military, it was the worst. Uh, that meant that you were eligible for military service. Many of us decided, hey, because we were talking amongst ourselves, we saw what was going on on TV in 1965 when they started televising it. And uh, we thought, hey, how do we, how do we get out of this? You know, well, uh, you could go to college and get a 2S department. They would take all the 1As before they took you. And uh, so that's what we did. Uh, I went ahead and enrolled at Del Mar. 
uh, found out very quickly though, college was not near as important as surfing. <laughs> and uh, found myself first semester on scholastic uh, probation, and then the second semester, because I wasn't attending classes for the most part. And uh, second semester, I uh, went on scholastic suspension, uh, and I was immediately classified 1A. So uh, I, was, I was eligible for military service. My dad, um, he said, well, son, before they draft you, I'm going to take you down and you're going to join. That way you get to choose what you want. Made sense to me. And in fact, uh, it's interesting that most men that served and women that served in Vietnam were not draftees, at least in combat. Uh, I read uh, an article that said about 25% that experienced combat were draftees. Now, of course, a lot of them were like me. We were getting ready to get drafted so we joined so we could have what we wanted. Otherwise, we would have been drafted anyway. So uh, my dad said, you're going to be a helicopter pilot. He knew something about aviation, and he said that was the best thing to be. Uh, he didn't tell me about a lot of the other aspects of flying, you know, uh, uh, the dangers uh, involved in bad weather and so forth, and the possibility of getting shot at. He didn't tell me about that either. But, uh, he was right, it was a great job. So at the age of 19, I went in the Army and uh, went to flight school. Uh, the first two months, every uh, veteran goes through basic training and then after the basic training, I went to Fort Polk, Louisiana for that. After basic training, uh, we all go to our advanced training. Some went to infantry, uh, others went to artillery, uh, transportation, a number of different uh, positions, uh, I went to flight school. Nine months later, and I, I'd like to, at this point, kind of give you an example, uh, an idea of what was going through our heads uh, as we proceeded to flight school. Um, a lot of people are under the false impression that, uh, you know, we were all trying to figure out how to get out of the mess we were in and, you know, the, uh, you know, first chance we got, we were in a ball. That was not the case. Um, when I graduated from flight school, at the time they were putting about a thousand pilots through a month. And uh, my class was 200, 200 pilots. We got our orders the last few days, and uh, we all knew we were going to Vietnam. There was no question we were going to Vietnam. And I received orders to Korea, 104, to receive orders to Korea. I thought I'd been betrayed. <laughs> what happened? I've been training to go to Vietnam and you're sending me to Korea. So uh, I went to personnel and I asked them what was the deal and why was I going to Korea and they said my brother at the time was in Vietnam. They wouldn't send two brothers at the same time. So uh, I, uh, they told me though if I could find somebody to trade orders they could care less. They just wanted a body. So I went back to the company and I started asking around. And I couldn't find anybody to trade orders with them. They all wanted to go to Vietnam. So, if you question the bravery of, of these young men like myself uh, that were willing to, to do what was right and and, uh, and use their training that they had that they had learned that the government has, had provided them uh, to do what they had been trained to do, and. Uh, so I went to Korea, but the whole time I was trying to figure out how to get back with my brothers. So 12 months later, I found myself standing at the top of those stairs, looking out over the landscape, smelling the, the jet fuel, the, the sounds of all the helicopters flying over everyone in uniform. It was, it was a, a startling revelation. That was the beginning, that was the first day of my 365 days. One tour was exactly one year. I'd like to talk now about those that did not make the full 365 days. Some came home wounded, but over 58,000 came home not alive of which 3,414 were Texans. So I'm going to do my best to get through this. 
as I said, I am not a poet, but um, I did just write a, a short poem, and it's about my experience. So I'd like to let you know what was in the heart of our veterans and the, and the Vietnam veteran. And I wrote it about the experience of, of going to the Vietnam Memorial for the first time. I don't know if you've been there, but it's a pretty imposing sight. It's nearly two football fields long, and it's black, shiny granite that you can see forever when you look at it. I first viewed the wall from a distance, a cold and rainy day in 1982. I found safety inside my car. Yes, it's the rain that keeps me here. Unwilling to open the door, I stared from the window at the black wall in the distance, a memorial of so many memories. Knowing it contained the names of so many of my brothers and sisters, how could I approach them? What could I say? Perhaps another day I will return. It would be 20 years before I would try again to approach the wall of names. This time I would not let them down. This time I would stay. As I got closer, the first name came into view. So small it was on that black ramp wall. Then another and another. I could see them now. My brothers and sisters who had fallen, they were there, all of them. The emotions I had inside of me for so many years suddenly and unexpectedly came out as tears. Tears from my fallen brothers and sisters, tears of sadness. And I cried out, look what they have done to us. I have returned several times since then. Each time gets easier because now I know as I stare into the black mirrored wall, I am there with my brothers and sisters. I'm finally home. So thank you all. One of the when when I was interviewing Robert and, and the others, they uh, I said, well, nobody the term you know, thank you for your service. That was never. You guys never received that, did you? Is that is that appropriate? You know, what what should we say to you guys? And Robert, I think it was you. It's one of the three of you. I'm gonna give you full credit because you're here today. But the the overwhelming response was, "How about welcome home?" So welcome home, Robert. And it's a blessing to have you here with us. My my favorite mate. In all, in all of Corpus Christi, all the land, <laughs> walked in a second ago, and uh, Mayor McComb, if you would make your way up here, we'd love to have you give a few remarks and then, uh, and then help us cut the ribbon. And, and uh, Dr. Lago has lost. It, it's a small hearing aid. Yeah. So, Look on the floor if you see a if you see a hearing aid, yell bingo and get in the <laughs> we'll get you a free teacher. <laughs> Mayor Joe McComb. Uh, I, I don't apologize for being late, I, but I do apologize for being late. <laughs> but the the reason is is that there are a number of. Uh, services and ceremonies uh, all over the community recognizing and appreciating the veterans and we try to make as many as we can and some of them run a little longer than the others so uh, I got here as quickly as I could. For one, I want to commend Brad for creating this museum. Uh, hearing him talk about 
back in 65, uh, when the Vietnam War was really kind of getting going, uh, I can recall it, it has a special place in my heart. We, uh, I was re a senior at Ray High School in 1965, and uh, they, many of the folks that graduated from there uh, at that time, uh, many of us went to college and, and many went to serve in the military. And the, uh, many friends returned and several friends did not, as well as numerous others both uh, did not return that we were obviously not aware of whose old were, but we knew they were fellow classmates and others. But uh, the two that uh, we all participated in that occupation or that activity or whatever you want to call it, that war, they, they didn't want to call it a war at the time because that was another thing back in the 60s. But uh, one of the fellows that, uh, whose name that I found in Washington when we went to the Vietnam Memorial was Kenneth Iring. Uh, Kenneth and I had grown up together. His father was my Little League baseball coach. We played Little League baseball together. His mother was uh, under the direction of Luther Jones at the time that Kenneth was killed in Vietnam. And then uh, Sanders Stroud, father. Some of you may have known his father here, Dr. Stroud, here in Corpus Christi. And I'm sure there's some others that I knew, but uh, when we were in Washington one time on a uh, trip up there on a city trip back in those days when I was on the council decades ago, uh, we'd go up there and it, we took a few minutes uh, and went out into the Vietnam Wall and once it was erected and, and looked at those names and it was, it was mind boggling uh, to think of that many Americans had lost their lives. And, and you mentioned what can we do to, to honor them and to honor the veterans that did return. And I think from the city standpoint as well as the other uh, as individuals, the way you honor these folks that went out and bled and died is breathe and live for what they died for. And if we can't share the greatness of America and continue our traditions, Somebody's laid down their lives that we've got the freedoms that we have. And if we're not careful, and I think you can see day by day, uh, these freedoms are slowly being eroded away. So I think the best way you can honor these men and women who are giving their lives in the past and currently, and it also makes me nervous. I've got a son-in-law that's in the Marines. He's a Cobra pilot. He's currently serving up in the Pentagon right now, but he's been to two trips to Iraq, one to Afghanistan, and fortunately, he's come back. Some of his buddies didn't, but he has to live with that. But the best thing I think we can do is breathe and live a life that would be worthy of their sacrifice, and that is sharing the American dream and fighting to keep it. And I hope we all do that. thank Brad for creating this uh, museum and uh, I think that will be a daily reminder because sometimes we forget we get busy we've got a lot of things on our plate but it's the day that we two days in a row if we forget is the day we start losing some of our freedoms we, it's got to be something that we're committed to and uh, we do every day is to remind ourselves of how grateful uh, we should be for the sacrifices of those that one lost their lives as well as those that were willing to give their lives and have come back home and continued to serve our country in the workforce or in the schools or in the raising of families, uh, but just their commitment, their willingness to give it all for those of us that were not able to go. So uh, thank you, Brad, for this opportunity. And it's a great uh, place you got here. And I think over the years, you'll see uh, lots of traffic through here because it, it means a lot. And uh, congratulations to you. And are you ready to cut the ribbon? You're <laughs> here already. <laughs> Just a, a couple of things, and, and Emily, are you going to talk about the uh, the reading of the names? Sure, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So well, you go ahead and tell. Well, the when we were hanging this exhibit with the with the beautiful dog tags that that uh, the Lexington USS Lexington produced, we were we did it alphabetically so people can find. But we were sitting in and we were calling, and some of those youngsters back there were helping us. And we we're calling out these names, and 
and Emily and my wife Liz is running somewhere and they were just going, you know, this, this, these guys deserve this. They deserve to have their names read out loud. And Keith and Abu and Gavin, our workforce here were saying, you know, these guys were, you know, five or six years younger than I am today. They're babies, believe me, um, when they die. And so, the again, I, it's just the, the evolution of the idea with lots of collaboration is that we're going to say every one of these names out loud today. We're, you people are going to help us. Some people are going to help us. If you want to help us, let us know. And we're going to just, if there's a thousand people or zero people, we're going to say 3,414 names out loud and we will let you know which ones are the uh, the corpus christians and um I, i'm i'm just telling you that one of the reason that this is such a great event here is because i had the brilliance and foresight to hire a young lady named emily Beasy who's gonna and she's worked for us all of a month i think and, um, but but emily is great and and the daughter of a Navy pilot. Uh, what, what was the rank? Commander. Mr. Commander Gray is right there. Please don't give me demerits for not knowing your rank, sir. Uh, and so I understood the whole process. So Emily, if you'll come up and then kind of guide us through the ribbon cutting process, I'd appreciate it. Just say a couple more thank yous real briefly. Um, like Brad said, I'm very new to this position in my previous role with the museum. I helped with Oktoberfest. So I had the opportunity to see this concept from, from the beginning all the way through to the installation and the completion. And I'm so thankful to be a part of an organization that is doing um, such a good thing for the state and for our community. So the thank yous, obviously, to the Lexington, who created 3,414 dog tags by hand, the USO of South Texas for their co-presenting of this organ or this memorial and all of the um, advice that we've received along the way from Sarah. Um, we had some volunteers that helped us sort, organize, and hang all of these. It was a monumental task. Um, we have Ronnie, or Rusty, right? Where are you, Rusty? Or Dusty, I'm so sorry, I'm getting nervous. Dusty, Tony, Ralph Cuevas. Um, we also had Emily Alvin who helped us, and then all of our staff, Keith, Gavin, Abu. It was a monumental task, and I really thank them for being here and um, for doing all of it. So, without any further ado, I think we should cut the ribbon. That's good. Mayor Macomb and Robert, will you come up with us?